was established in memory of Tom Olson, an outstanding journalist and author, who was also an enthusiastic supporter of St. Bride's. So it's a great delight for us to be able to honor him each year at this event. And lovely too to have Tom's son, Tim, and his wife, Heather, with us here again tonight. Very special thanks are due to Kaizo, who are once again generously supporting this occasion. We're most grateful to you for your support. And looking ahead, one of our other forthcoming events is our annual REN Talk this year on the 20th of October, which will be given by Rory Coonan, former Director of Architecture at the Arts Council of Great Britain and Honorary Fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. But back to tonight, uh, please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off because apart from the obvious reason, they can also cause interference with our sound system, I am reliably informed. Um, but now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Tom Whipple, who will be introducing tonight's speaker and chairing the question and answer session at the end. Tom is the science editor at The Times, who is a distinguished and prolific author on all matters scientific. His publications include a 2020 book entitled A Little Light, 20 Ways the Coronavirus, uh, the coronavirus Response Could Make the World Better, to which he contributed. So who better to introduce this evening's lecture than Tom Whipple. Over to you, Tom. Hello, it's an honor to be here. Um, I think about two hours ago, almost exactly, Liz Truss zoomed along the roads just behind us to deliver her first speech as Prime Minister. Um, in that speech, she said, we shouldn't be daunted by the challenges we face. As strong as the storm may be, I know the British people are stronger. And what are those challenges? Foremost, she said, was the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, COVID obviously isn't over yet, but somehow also its aftermath is here. Um, it's here in NHS waiting lists, it's here in the emptier tube trains we took here, it's here arguably in the fact that Liz Truss is Prime Minister at all. Um, we are tremendously lucky to have here for this lecture uh, Dr. Carol Cooper, um, hopefully we discussed this before, hopefully I'll get her many job titles correct. She is a journalist, a GP, an academic, now a novelist, um, and I must, I've put a big note for me to plug her book at the end. I'm going to plug her book at the beginning as well, in the, in the terrible uh, chance that I'd forget at the end. She will be signing her book at the end. Um, she teaches at Imperial College on medicine and the media, and I think in a time when medicine has interacted with the media perhaps more than ever before in history, who better to come and talk to us about the aftermath of COVID-19? Thank you for inviting me tonight to give the Tom Olson lecture. It's a, a rare privilege to be here. I've been here many times before in St. Bride's Church, and I, what I'm usually doing is trying not to sing out of key. So this time it's just my speaking voice, and um, not the singing, luckily. Um, I think I'm here because I'm supposed to know stuff. But if I've learned one thing from COVID, is that we knew next to nothing um, when it began. Um, we've been talking since March 2020 about when things get back to normal and now uh, we've realized we're looking at a very new normal. Um, so I'll be talking about where we are now and my views are personal. 
Um, there were, if you've come here because you used to read my columns in Punch magazine, I'm sorry, there won't be many belly laughs because I don't find COVID that funny. Um, but you will be getting my personal views and I'll be talking mostly about the UK. Um, I think one of the first things to, that we learnt about COVID is that it wasn't the media hype that some people thought it was. We were told it was all dreamt up by the media to sell newspapers. And of course, uh, it, it's proven after 185,000 deaths in the UK and um, possibly an estimated six and a half million deaths worldwide, it was not a hoax, it was very real. And I think one of the big wins for, uh, it, during the pandemic was actually medical journalism because we owe a lot to people like Hugh Pym, uh, the BBC and others who spread the word about COVID, who spread decent, solid advice. I'm going to make an exception for one or two newspapers, but I'm not going to mention them. So I hope you don't work for any of them. Um, it was also a win for COVID vaccines, of course, because although they're not perfect, they came out in record time and they saved an estimated 20, 20 million lives worldwide just in the first year. So I think that was a win. I, I would have liked uh, it to be uh, a win also for community spirit and I thought it was going to be. Uh, yeah, it was great to see that it sold Faraday started it and it was, it was good that we saw networks of volunteers go up in many, many neighborhoods. But I think we've also seen um, a, quite a lot of uh, hoarding, um, unseemly squabbles over shelves of pasta and blue rolls. And we've seen people just wearing masks how and when they feel like it, and then casually uh, throwing them onto the pavement. So it's, I don't think it's been that big a win for community spirit. But um, one of the things I wanted to say is that um, COVID-19 uh, was the first pandemic to occur in a fully globalized and networked society. So from that point of view, it's nothing like Spanish flu of 1918. We already had the tech that, to enable us to do things virtually. It was mostly there. Not everyone had fiber broadband, sure, but we were able to do things virtually. And I was teaching medical students at Imperial College virtually for nearly two years. And that was, I think that was quite a challenge because I was teaching them consultation skills. And normally that's a really interactive part of their studies. They, they have actors simulating patients. They have to deal with them as if they were real patients. And of course, you can't, you can't do all of that uh, virtually. Your body language is extremely important to any consultation. And how can you do it um, over Zoom, especially with a failing connection? So that was, um, that was difficult, I think. Um, and I do fear, I think, for some of the doctors of tomorrow, or they're already doctors now, but they haven't, they haven't really got as much confidence in clinical examination as they should. They perhaps haven't quite got the experience in picking up subtle clues from patients they haven't held a dying patient's hand. So they, they don't have all of those things that I would like them to have. Um, they have to learn it on the job. And we all started working from home if we could. Um, it was fabulous if you could sit in your pajamas all day and with a cat on your lap. But um, not everybody, of course, had a spare room that they could turn into a home office. Not everybody had space or quiet. Um, some people just had to push the breakfast plates off the table and, and work from, from the kitchen table. Um, and it, it was hard. But I think, nonetheless, uh, we've seen lots of pros and cons, but nonetheless, I think hybrid working is probably here to stay. Or is it? Uh, who knows, with rising costs. It, it, it certainly means that presenteeism is passe, and uh, as it should be, I think, and that your back office staff could be anywhere. And in many cases, who even needs a front office um, if you're working virtually? And that's probably why M&S, well, most branches have stopped selling men's suits. So what do you save on clothing? Um, you're going to be spending more than that on heating bills, I think, if you work from home. 
Um, it's, uh, it's also, I think, working from home has an effect on sharing ideas, on mood, on morale, um, on motivation, and esprit de corps. And I think even people who normally um, used to working in physical isolation found it hard. And like many authors, I found it difficult to get my next novel out. It was a bit like walking through treacle, to be honest. Um, but luckily, you know, we've had social media, and that was there, that was there beforehand, and it, it boomed and it permeated almost every aspect of life. And I think it served lots of functions for learning, for information, for entertainment. But unfortunately, I think all the functions got muddled and, and mixed up, especially on some platforms, um, like TikTok, for example. And um, influencers grew in influence. And I think we've now got a, a scenario where a fifth of people are more likely, according to a recent survey, to listen to influencers about medical matters than to go to someone who's medically qualified. Um, but um, then we've had WhatsApp and Zoom quizzes, filling the gap left by uh, fear of going out. And we've also had a lot of doom scrolling, uh, people compulsively scrolling or searching for uh, information, especially about um, the, vir the virus. And I think that's quite habit-forming. It's, it soared during the pandemic. And that's, I think we're hardwired to do this, I think, because there's evolutionary pressure on any species, I, I would imagine, to use early warning systems in order to help them survive. Um, I think social media has also risen to a lot, given rise to a lot of very polarized opinions coming to the surface. We've always had polarized opinions, but social media has given them greater voice and greater vehemence, I think, uh, especially um, when it comes to COVID matters, masking and vaccines. Um, and I'm getting uh, at least weekly messages from an old school friend who um, telling me all about the dangers of this horrible experimental vaccine. And she did that throughout 2021, which I spent most of giving vaccines. Um, I think she did it deliberately because she knew I was vaccinated and wanted to make me feel bad. But then, you know, we, d we know that people, uh, my medical students tell me that we, their relatives get a lot more information from WhatsApp groups. And when it directly contradicts the mainstream medical messages, they'll still go for auntie's uh, advice on the WhatsApp group. Um, I think that's not a, a terribly healthy development, but there it is. I, many people found their tribe on, on social media and uh, reinforcing their opinions, whether they're right or wrong. COVID restrictions obviously forced families apart. And I imagine, like me, many of you found that Chris Whitty's face became more familiar to you than those of your own family. Uh, I certainly could see the chief medical officer every night on TV, but if I wanted to see my son, I'd have to meet him in Primrose Hill. And because the regulations meant that you couldn't <laughs> sit down, we didn't sit on a bench. We kept walking in the cold. And worse, of course, um, is when you have close family living abroad and um, for myself, I had an elderly stepmother in the US and I didn't get to say goodbye to her. And there were so many people dying alone. I'm sure you each have your own stories. I'm just going to put up this slide from um, Tisha Greenhouse, who's professor of primary care, who uh, said goodbye to her mother from the hospital car park in, at the end of 2020. And I think her tweet encapsulates the reality of the time. On to younger people. Um, but if you work with adolescents or you have it in your family, you already know that COVID's not been fantastic for the mental health. And whether you look at the Prince's Trust Youth Index, uh, which was this year, or the Young Mind Survey from last year, it, the results are similar and they show an all-time low in the mental health of young people. And um, over a third, in fact, 36% uh, believe the pandemic that worsens their stress levels in the long term. 
um, almost half of young people aged 16 to 25 experience burnout. Half also have feelings of self-loathing or problems with their mental health, especially anxiety. And in the Young Mind Survey, it's alarming that they found many, um, mainly the teenagers, but they looked at people 13 to 25. They were self-harming again, having panic attacks, and losing motivation and hope for the future. And about two-thirds um, thought that that um, the pandemic would have a long-term negative effect on their mental health. And well-being and confidence were worse in those out of work or out of school, um, or those from poorer backgrounds. I want to talk a bit about school because um, it, it was a very difficult line for schools to tread. Um, they, it shows how much, I think, the, how much we rely on schools to teach much more than the three R's. A lot of children starting school are barely toilet trained. Um, and um, as to socialising, school is really important, especially the primary school years. Children skin their knees, they learn to hold a pen, they learn to make friends, they learn to, to become human. And it's not quite so positive for development if they're in a, a cramped um, home with not a single book. And we know from the recent Child Literacy Trust that a fifth of uh, children aged five to eight do not have a book of their own, not a single one. Um, the teachers adapted online lessons, and that was great for some, but um, a lot of children had to, use the, had to rely on the same laptop that a parent was using for work. So um, that wasn't exactly adequate. I think it's been very difficult in terms of child and adolescent mental health services because they were already really, really stretched, well, let me say barely adequate, um, before the pandemic started. Now, the Department for Education State of the Nation report in 2021, which looked at um, the effects of disruption in, in school teaching and, and in the wider controls uh, of the pandemic, um, they pointed out that, as you might expect, the lowest socioeconomic groups were disproportionately affected. And a lockdown's behind us, for sure. Well, I think. But all of childhood is a critical period of development, and it's not always possible to catch up. And so it spirals, uh, with the gap between the haves and have-nots getting wider. And disruption to schooling also raises those age-old questions. How much should a parent do, and how much does one leave to other agencies? Um, what's the family's responsibility, and what can we reasonably expect the state to provide? Those are really tricky questions. I'm going to go on to university education, because I know a bit more about, about that. And um, I keep hearing students say, it's not the experience I expected. They obviously, they expected stimulating lectures, mad social world, and then, you know, three years down the line, a time-honored ritual, you've, down, you've done some fake fur on a hot day, and you're down Prosecco. And I think it's not the experience they expected. It sounds a little false and superficial, right? But it goes a lot deeper than that. And I think we depend so much on on sharing education experiences to learn. We generate energy by sharing education experiences. So isolation really had an impact on, on that generation. And of course, isolation also had a mental health impact. A lot of students were not flourishing intellectually, they were just getting by. They were worried about getting through the term, they were worried about getting through the week. And of course, they're worried about their future, their long-term future. Um, especially when you didn't have, um, you couldn't go to career fairs, you couldn't have real live interviews and so on. Um, and they were angry, I think, as well about fees for, for online learning. Fees already deter quite a few students from going to university. But they were, they were saying, well, why do we have to pay the same for online lectures? 
Um, I think online teaching was quite hard for the staff as well, but that's a completely different story. I can see their point. And all this feeds into the debate about value for money in higher education. Um, what should one pay for higher education? How much should one invest in one's own education? How much should other people invest? And courses with no immediate use to the workplace um, may stop being offered. But I think we've got it wrong if we do that. Um, I think packing the brain with information just to regurgitate it years later in an office is not the point of higher education. Education is not the filling of a vessel, it's the lighting of a fire. I'm going to cheer you up with some alcohol and tobacco. The pubs shut, so people drank at home. A lot. A lot. Um, in the year to March 2021, um, this is a figure from Public Health England, there was a nearly 60% rise in um, people drinking at a higher risk level. And if you want to know what that is, that's about 50 units a week for a man and 35 units a week for a woman. And corresponding to that, uh, in 2020, alcohol-specific deaths rose by 20%. And there was also a steep rise in alcoholic liver disease. Um, and a third of all the alcohol-specific deaths occurred, surprise, surprise, in the most deprived fifth of the country, like the Northeast. Um, coming to tobacco, a study from UCL showed that just in the first pandemic, 25% um, more young adults, well, 18 to 34, uh, more, uh, the number of 18 to 34 year old smokers went up by 25% just in the first lockdown. And as a result, there are now over 650,000 more young adults who smoke compared with before the pandemic. Um, many drinkers and smokers, the, the damage is already done, and it's going to worsen if they continue. Um, and um, there's a government target to make uh, England smoke-free by 2030. Well, if that's going to happen, smokers are going to have to quit at a rate 40% faster than predicted. And uh, quite honestly, if you've lost motivation and hope for the future, what incentive is there to stop smoking and to cut down on drinking? Um, I'm not making an excuse. I think that's just the reality. Now, families were forced apart, as I said, but they were also forced together. and. Um, well, domestic violence has been around for millennia, I guess. We just don't have the data for it. And I think it noticeably worsened during the pandemic. I don't want to fall headlong into the post hoc fallacy, so I'll just give you some figures. The Counting Dead Women Project estimated that the first three weeks of the first lockdown um, saw 16 domestic abuse killings of women and children, which was the highest in 11 years. And uh, the charity Refuge showed that in the first eight months of the pandemic, their health crime calls went up over 60%. So that includes calls and, and other contacts on their helpline. Um, and the visits to their website rose sevenfold. Uh, that probably reflects um, that it's much easier to go online if your perpetrator is anywhere near you than it is to make a phone call. And I think there's been a change in, in those who perpetrate. So a study from LSE and London Met Police show that there's a drop of over 11% in abuse by former partners, but over 8% increase in abuse from current partners and a 7% increase in abuse from family members. And the calls to the Met Police also went up during this period. And they were mainly from third parties, not the survivors. Now in lockdown, 
a lot of people got a puppy, but worse, some got a baby, and they didn't always plan to. Unplanned pregnancies rose from 1.3% pre-lockdown to 2.1% post-lockdown. This is the first lockdown. Um, that's a fairly low figure, but that's the way the research at UCL went, because they, they were looking at women who were, who were using contraception. And I think it's likely to be an underestimate, because there are mostly women who continued with their pregnancy. But the, the really important thing is that unplanned births are linked with negative social and economic outcomes, not just for the parents, obviously, but for the children. And I think you can expect to see effects to multiply. Uh, unintended pregnancy spawns new problems, which then grow up to be bigger problems. You wondered when I was going to talk about medical care, didn't you? Well, there's been a lot of discussion on all aspects of medical care, and I hope to be concise, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so early March 2020, NHS England told GPs to consult remotely. And I think given the lack of PPE and the lack of testing for COVID, that was a, quite a good idea. But it's remote consultations are risky, and they need a lot of staff training. Um, and I, I do want to point out that telemedicine and remote consults were, are not new. Um, I worked in, in a practice where we did a lot of telemedicine nearly 15 years ago. And more recently, I worked in a practice where all the requests for an appointment were triaged on the phone by the GP. So you couldn't actually make an appointment, which is very similar to where we are now. And I found that there were pros and cons. And the problems, of course, were mainly for those who were less articulate than others, but they're also for those who are at work. If you, know, if you get told that the GP is going to ring you back and you don't know when that morning they're going to ring you back, how are you supposed to do your day's work? So it is it's difficult. And for me, I think there are more, more cons than pros. The, certainly, the sudden nationwide change to mostly remote uh, consultation was difficult for the, shall we say, digitally excluded, who became more excluded. And even though now uh, over two-thirds of GP consultations are conducted face-to-face, -face, I do think COVID has changed general practice forever. We do perhaps more tests than we did before we examined patients. And I do worry about that. I worry about its impact on clinical assessment. The technology of remote consulting is new, but to my mind, it's a backward step um, in time because examination is the one thing that a medic does that you don't get on your WhatsApp group, you don't get on Google, you don't get from your well-meaning neighbor over the fence. And I think also doing the tests before examination Sometimes it's necessary for sure, but doing, routinely doing that puts a lot of pressure on tests. Um, some of them may not be necessary. Some of them would, may not have been necessary if the patient had been thoroughly examined, if they'd had the time and opportunity. So there's that. Looking at emergency care, where are we now? Well, you know these figures. They change regularly and not in a good way. How much is due to COVID is a moot point, but at least some of it is. I mean, we know that clinical resources were redeployed, so if you were going to go to your dermatology clinic, you know, you couldn't because your dermatologist had been redeployed to a COVID ward, and it, for example. And we also know that staff got ill uh, from COVID, were unable to work. Looking at uh, ambulances, uh, it's the weights are not looking good, and some areas look worse than others. So in the West Midlands, a 999 caller with a suspected heart attack or stroke is told it, it could be several hours before the ambulance gets to them. And those hours are probably crucial. When you get uh, to A, &E, when you get into your ambulance, um, you may be outside the hospital for 12 hours or inside for 12 hours. 
and nearly a thousand patients a day have to wait at least 12 hours in A&E. It was bad before COVID. The four hour target, which is that line um, on the graph, uh, the solid black line on the graph, the four hour target wasn't met at national level in any year since uh, 2013, 14, and it wasn't met in any month since July, 2015. Um, so we were already on a downward trajectory. Um, and the bottleneck is uh, in hospital staff and in social care. But there is also the fact that more is done in A&E now. So compared with 10 years ago, if you go to A&E, you'll get more tests done while you're there. Um, it is more high tech, it's going to take longer. We need to account for that. Um, so that's, that's an important facet that I think probably hasn't been looked at. In any way, the delays that I've been talking about, they are dangerous. And it's estimated by the Association of Ambulance Chief Execs that over 39,000 people last year came to severe harm as a direct result of ambulance delays. I'm going to look more generally at waiting lists. And um, you're probably well aware that NHS England failed to meet its target to wipe out two-year waits by the end of July this year. Um, they have reduced them, but they haven't wiped them out. And we do have about 400,000 people waiting more than one year for hospital treatment. Um, so the total um, official figure of people waiting is 6.7 million in June. You've probably also read that there's another hidden uh, list of people waiting for follow-up appointments. So it's likely that the overall total is significantly higher. And uh, it's certainly 60% higher than before the pandemic. Um, I think uh, this there's a lot of regional variation, but I don't see it looking good anywhere that I've heard of. Um, orthopedics is the worst, and uh, there's a reversal of the north-south divide for orthopedics, because in Devon you will wait much longer to see an orthopedic surgeon than you would in Tyneside. And I don't have any figures for ophthalmology, but I know from speaking to colleagues and, and to the local optician, that there have been many, many cancelled eye clinics in the last two and a half years, and people literally losing their sight. As for cancer, COVID-19 has dramatically lengthened every single step of a cancer patient's pathway for diagnosis and treatment. And nearly 40,000 wait more than two months after GP referral for suspected cancer which should be a two-week wait. Um, if you're waiting for treatment, about 35% wait over two months for treatment. And that's incredibly stressful. But it's not just stressful, because we know that on average, every month delay for cancer treatment raises mortality by 10%. It's clearly going to be different for different cancers. That's why I said on average. But um, it's, it's not good. And since lockdown especially, many people wait to consult their doctor with symptoms. Even when the symptoms are red flag symptoms that any medic would take really seriously. This is despite health education campaigns. Um, so we know now that half of people with possible signs of cancer wait six months before even talking to their GP. We also know from research by Cancer Research UK that poorer people are less likely to see the GP, which reduces their survival chances. So all in all, this is the depressing reality that suffering is our new normal. And um, I, it's hard to escape the conclusion that the NHS is dying from COVID. It was pretty sick before. 
But then COVID came along, jumped into the ring and dealt a final blow. It's true that we've had, we've had new diseases to look after. It wasn't all there before. We had COVID to treat, for sure. We've also got the challenge of long COVID. And um, ONS estimates that we have 2 million people in the UK with long COVID. So about one in eight of us has symptoms three to five months after the initial infection with COVID. And as a result of long-term symptoms, there are over a quarter of a million more people who are economically active since COVID, um, which brings the total of economically inactive people to 450,000. This is the highest um, number of economically inactive people due to chronic ill health. I've put the symptoms here uh, for long COVID. Um, These are just some of them. So intense fatigue and joint pain, um, joint inflammation, uh, tingling uh, extremities, ringing in the ears, loss of taste or smell that persists after the first uh, initial infection. Uh, cognitive problems, like head feeling like it's a marshmallow, and breathing problems. Um, And very few people have the full house of symptoms, luckily. But it still has, as you can imagine, uh, a huge effect on quality of life. And it doesn't just impact on working life, of course. It's going to impact on family life. And it's what I call compromised parenting. Uh, And that is clearly going to have an effect, I think, on the next generation. Now, I was lucky. I had long COVID, but after about four months, I, I got well enough. I stopped moaning, so I was, obviously, I was obviously better. But some people have symptoms for over two years, um, which we, we do have a problem with that. The pandemic is another, uh, the effect of the pandemic on um, health staff, on clinicians especially, has been enormous. It's had a high uh, effect, it's a high level effect um, on doctors and on nurses. And I think they put their health on the line for the public. They put their well-being on the line and many actually lost their lives. Others got burnt out, they were very distressed, developed PTSD, especially those who were redeployed to acute care. Um, Nurses particularly were distressed because they couldn't offer the kind of compassionate care that they, they were expected to and that they were trained to do and that they wanted to. Um, GPs tell a similar story. They couldn't practice good medicine. Uh, they just had to do what they could. Um, and where's the care for the frontline staff who endured extreme psychological effects? Because I don't count clapping. Um, the GMC looked at doctor burnout. They've been looking at doctor burnout for the last four years. Don't ask me why they didn't start before, but. That's another long tail, I expect. Um, Anyway, Dr. Burnout has reached record levels. um, So it's at its highest since they started counting. And if you don't care about it, you probably should, because about 42% of GPs or GP trainees want to leave in the next five years. So it's seriously going to deplete the workforce at a time when each practice already has over 2,000 more patients than they did seven years ago. Now, the reason they've got more patients is not just a population boom, in case you're wondering. It's because a lot of smaller practices have had to close because they've not had the support staff. So what are we going to do about it? We desperately need more staff. We need to stop hemorrhaging the staff that we've got. But look what's happening. Um, the NHS is currently recruiting only 4,000 new GP trainees a year. And they've just decided to end um, special COVID leave for NHS staff. So they won't get paid leave if they want to isolate because of COVID. They have to keep working. 
There's also a tight cap on medical school places for 2020 entry. And um, the number of applicants getting in this year for medicine is just over 16%, whereas it was just over 20% last year. I don't think it, the answer is just to make more places for medical students, because obviously there has to be joined up thinking. The whole, the whole thing about manpower needs to be looked at. Um, if we train new doctors, they've got to have jobs to go to, and they've got to have jobs to progress to when they're a bit more experienced and a bit older, and so on. But uh, anyway, at, the po at this point, it gives me um, about as much hope as I'd have of filling a bath when I hadn't put a plug in it. There's been a loss of trust in authority, as, as uh, you might imagine. Um, this is research from King's London and the University of Sheffield. And um, when they did it, at the, they did this survey at the end of December 2021. People said the overall experience of the pandemic had reduced the general level of trust in the government. Well, 45% of people they, they interviewed said this. And when they had run the previous survey eight months previously, only 36% said that the experience of the pandemic had reduced their trust in the government. And at the point when they did this last um, the research in 2021, end of, uh, they found that one in 10 people were willing to support violent demos uh, related to lockdown and other restrictions. And uh, if they got most of their information from social media, they were much more likely to, um, to want to support demos. Um, I don't know if you're surprised by the loss of trust. Uh, I'm not. As I think from a dire lack of PPE at the beginning, when we had staff getting ill and dying, to now having to spend over five million pounds a week to store it in warehouses. That's pretty jaw-dropping. Um, and then we've got the figure of 37 billion for test and trace in its first two years. And that figure's often bandied about, but it is verifiable. And I don't think any of this is going to help poverty. And when there's poverty for so many, for individuals, for families, all feel the pinch and will continue to feel the pinch. Charities reported an increased demand for their help uh, when COVID hit, but income fell, especially with lots of events like the London Marathon. So where are we now? Um, I already mentioned littering and hoarding and masks if you feel like it, and I could add snitching on the neighbors, and if I'm allowed to generalize a bit more, we've probably become a bit more xenophobic. I don't think it helps to talk about the China virus. I don't think Brexit has helped um, because the NHS relies on staff from abroad, and um, I don't think they feel that welcome here. I think COVID has also divided us in terms of our opinions. Some act as if COVID is completely over, and others are still afraid of going out and worried about the next virus and when that might hit. And it's a bit like living on the San Andreas Fault. So um, I, think, I think it's time for my last slide. You've been very patient. Has COVID fractured the way we live? I think it's made the cracks wider. I think it's shown the fragility of our society and of the systems that we depend on. And we're no longer treasuring or nurturing the social structures that developed over a long, long period of time. We've got some new vaccines and new, newer ones on the way, and more people have taken up gardening. Um, but on the whole, I think that uh, we've, while we've gone forwards in terms of technology, we've gone backwards in human values. And we've forgotten what's important. And we may be more connected than ever, but without the human connections that matter, now, someone once told me that everything that one could have done could have been done differently, but it wasn't. So here we are. And I can't talk about how to fix things, but I think the approach should be holistic. So it's, it's a bit like when someone's injured 
and it's not enough for the doctor to patch up that injury and send the patient away on crutches. You have to look at why they fell in the first place and try to deal with that. Thank you very much. Thank you.